Mother Russia. Okay, so a lot of you asked me if I'm going to continue with the Napoleonic War series from Epic History TV. Of course I'm going to do it because those are great videos and as I said and as I promised I'm going to cover all the videos in that series. So uh, as always the link to the original video is going to be in the description below. Go give them a view and a like. If you have something interesting to add or to correct me uh, please do it in the comment section below. But here is the long awaited invasion of Russia in 1812. So I'm interested in what they're going to be uh, mentioning and so on. So uh, yeah let's just jump into the video. Russia, 1812. Yemen. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's yep. resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, Krasny. His army begins the most infamous retreat in history. Yeah. Yeah, may, Napoleon's retreat from Russia is maybe one of the most famous defeats in history, in I would say. In 1807, following his defeat of the Russian army at Friedland, Napoleon had traveled to Tilsit to meet the Russian Emperor Alexander. The peace negotiations. During their celebrated encounter, the two emperors formed a friendship and made an alliance. But it was not to last. Over the next five years, relations between France and Russia cooled dramatically. The Russians were irritated by Napoleon's creation of a duchy of Warsaw in Poland, which they regarded as meddling in their own front yard. They feared it would lead to the return. Yeah, with the establishment of the duchy of Warsaw, they uh, put a torn in the Russians' eyes, but the Polish soldiers that were part of the uh, of the French army, of Napoleon's army, were, pr were very loyal, like till the end of the war. And of a fully-fledged Polish state, a traditional thorn in Russia's side. Then there was Napoleon's offer to marry Alexander's sister, Grand Duchess Anna Pavlovna, to cement their alliance. Not gonna the happen. The Romanovs hated the idea. And after a year of Russian prevarication, Napoleon married Marie Louise, daughter of the Austrian Emperor, instead. Yep. Later that year, Napoleon broke a guarantee made at Tilsit and annexed the Duchy of Oldenburg, ruled by Alexander's sister's father in law. Worst of all was the fallout over the continental system, Napoleon's not very effective economic blockade against Britain designed to cripple his most steadfast enemy. Alexander had agreed to join the continental system at Tilsit. <laughs> but it was hugely unpopular in Russia and ruinous to her finances during a period of economic crisis. When Napoleon found out that Russia was flouting the rules of the system and had resumed an illicit trade with Britain, he was furious. With both emperors accusing the other of bad faith, their two countries began preparing for war. Okay, so just a quick note. Okay, so the continental blockade where he practically wanted to starve Great Britain into submission failed not only because the cooperation between Great Britain and the Russians, but as we mentioned and as they also mentioned, uh, because of the black market that started to flourish in other European countries. Plus, uh, we need to take into account that the guerrilla warfare in uh, the Iberian Peninsula, so in Spain and in Portugal, with their troops and with British support, they're giving the, Fra the French a hard time. And Napoleon is somewhere around here, so he doesn't have a firm grip on, uh, uh, on the Iberian Peninsula. But one of the things that's going well for him is keeping the Austrian Empire neutral while, you know, like, uh, looking to attack uh, Russia. Uh, because he married the daughter Marie Louise. So that was actually a brilliant move from his part. 
This video is brought to you by our sponsor, Curiosity Stream, home of more than two and a half thousand documents. I'm gonna let it roll, but I'm gonna make it a little bit. Yeah, the thing is, Segway. The thing is, uh, there are there are a lot of um, oversimplifications of the Napoleon's invasion of Russia. So everybody talks about, you know, like the 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 Russian winter. Well, yeah, it had a great impact, but the Russian summer also had a maybe a bigger impact. But there's always, you know, like the myth that uh, the French army just lost because of the Russian winter. Winter, no. The Russians gave them a, a, a hard time, especially the Russian Cossacks, Cossacks um, which are, you know, like an inte integral part of Russian history, but also uh, guerrilla fighters, so partisan fighters that were constantly cutting away the supply chain that Napoleon desperately needed to supply his army in Russia. Napoleon knew an invasion of Russia was a massive undertaking, especially as he still had an unfinished war in Spain that was tying down more than 200,000 yep. troops. Nevertheless, in 1811, he began to assemble the largest army Europe had ever seen, around 600,000 men, though less than half of them were French. The rest came from allied states across Europe. There was a Polish corps from the Duchy of Warsaw, led by Prince Poniatowski, a corps from each of the German kingdoms of Saxony, Westphalia and Bavaria, from the Kingdom of Italy, as well as Swiss, Dutch, Croat, Spanish and Portuguese units scattered throughout the army. There were even contingents from Prussia and Austria, France's recent yep. enemies, now uneasy allies. Some of these allied troops it's quite good that he always uh, uh, kind of kind of explains that. So bear with me. It was a big problem for the French, the constant warfare against Prussia and then Austria and then Russia and then uh, the, 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 the Iberian Peninsula War and so on. So all the old veterans that were the most experienced ones were always, you know, like... Uh, um, um, reinfor the army was always reinforced with new recruits who were unexperienced and so on. And as he said, Russia was a big, big, big undertaking. And with that undertaking, he, like, like the new recruits that he took, I think that it was a big minus on his part. I mean, he d didn't have any other options, but uh, those unexperienced soldiers in that kind of conditions and... I think that it was one of the main points why why he lost so badly in Russia. Not to minimize the Russian soldiers, but but you know, like uh, it was a big part of it. Troops such as the Poles and Germans were as reliable as their French counterparts. Others were very inexperienced, or like the Prussians and Austrians, reluctant to be there at all. Yep. This gigantic formation was deployed in three armies. The main force under Napoleon himself, another led by his stepson, Eugène, and a third led by his younger brother, Jérôme, King of Westphalia. Neither of these two were experienced commanders. Though one would distinguish himself on campaign, the other would not. Uh, one quick note, as far as I know, approximately one third of the whole you know, like army that he assembled right here to attack Russia was made out of German soldiers from the different, uh, you know, like allied states. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think it approximately one third of the soldiers were, you know, like Germans. On their left flank, Marshal MacDonald led 10th Corps with a large Prussian contingent, while the right flank was guarded by General Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps. Another 100,000 troops were in reserve, including Marshal Victor's 9th Corps. Initially, the Russians only had 220,000 men to face this juggernaut. Organized into Barclay de Tolle's 1st Army, Prince Bagration's 2nd Army, 
and General Tomasov's third army. They would be outnumbered two to one. But in the run-up, Mother Russia. Russia scored two crucial diplomatic triumphs. Sweden had been at war with Russia just three years earlier, a conflict which cost her Finland. By a curious turn of events, Sweden was now ruled by Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte. But after Napoleon occupied Swedish Pomerania without warning, a furious Bernadotte promised Russia that Sweden would remain neutral. Really? Meanwhile, a peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire ended Russia's six-year war against its southern rival. These two agreements secured Russia's flanks from any strategic threat and freed up troops to face Napoleon's invasion. Yeah, it is the most difficult enterprise you ever went to. On the 24th of June, 1812, French troops began crossing the Nyman River into Russian territory. The army was so large, the crossing took five days. Napoleon's plan was to attack north of the impassable Pripet marshes and defeat Barclay's army, while Jerome pinned Bagration in place. French forces would then swing south to trap Bagration. Napoleon expected the campaign to be over in five weeks. But the sheer size of the French army convinced the cautious Barclay that retreat was his only option. Prince Bagration, a much more aggressive commander by instinct, and often Barclay's fierce critic, was forced to agree. As they withdrew, they burned villages and crops, part of a scorched earth strategy to deny supplies to the enemy. In four days, Napoleon had reached Vilnius, but Barclay was gone. To the south... Yeah, scorched earth, that, that, that's uh, a tactic that the Russians used in, in this war, and it was pretty effective. And, you know, like nations that were at war prior to that used that tactic a lot, lot, lot time, a lot of times, uh, and the thing with scorched earth is you you cannot use it all the time. The thing is you retreat constantly with small skirmishes, and then you burn down everything as you retreat, so that uh, uh, that that uh, enemy army needs to be more reliant on the supply chain than on uh, you know like plundering and pillaging local villages and cities to supply themselves. So they're more. Uh, 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 reliant on the supply chain. And that, of course, brings a lot of difficulties for the attacking army. But Scorch Earth tactics are actually only effective, as far as I know, uh, in uh, if you're defending or if you're defending a la large mass, a lot or large area. So you know that you're like you, you, you wouldn't be effective if. You know, like you need just need to defend this small part of the Baltic uh, area, and he attacks you from here. It, it doesn't work. But Russia, as a massive, massive, massive land country, uh, that was probably the best idea that they had. I mean, the most effective. I, I mean, I can see it. I can see it that that it was a logical path for them. Jerome failed to pin down Bagration. So when Davout's first corps swung southeast to trap him, he'd already withdrawn to safety. Napoleon's younger brother was out of his depth, stung by the Emperor's criticism, humiliated when his troops were put under Marshal Davout's command, he resigned his post and returned to Westphalia. The campaign was already beginning to expose serious flaws in Napoleon's plan. Knowing his troops would struggle to live off the land in this impoverished region, he'd organized huge supply depots and transport units to feed the army. But wagons rolled slowly along Russia's bad roads, which were turned to rivers of mud by summer thunderstorms. Yeah. The army had to make frequent stops to allow its supplies to catch up. Bad news for Napoleon's plan to catch the Russians but a much-needed relief for the many thousands of young conscripts in his army, not used to hard marches day after day. Many were soon dropping out with exhaustion, 
others deserted. There were also huge problems of command and control over a vast multinational army that was three times bigger than any Napoleon had commanded before. La Grande Armée, once famed for its speed of manoeuvre, had become a lumbering beast. True. After a pause to rest and regroup at Vilnius, Napoleon resumed his advance. Barclay continued his retreat to Vitebsk, where he hoped Bagration's second army would be able to join him. But Davout blocked Bagration's path at Soltanovka, forcing him to make for Smolensk instead. At Vitebsk, Napoleon clashed with Barclay's rearguard, but once more the Russians escaped, after setting fire to all the stores they couldn't take with them. Meanwhile, 300 miles away, on Napoleon's southern flank, Russian 3rd Army attacked and defeated the Saxon 7th Corps, forcing Napoleon to divert Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps to their aid. By the end of July, Napoleon had advanced 250 miles into Russia, much further than he'd planned. And the long marches in extreme summer heat continued to take a heavy toll on his men. Without And just imagine those 400 kilometers needed to be guarded. So as you're advancing and the scorch earth tactic starts to, you know, like take more and more impact on, on, on the warfare and so on, you need to secure your supply line, so you need to leave soldiers at the border of the supply line on, on each side. So your army, as you're advancing, is dying of disease, of uh, hunger, whatever, of the climate. Uh, it's dying in battle, plus you're reducing your army as more and more you advance to keep up the flow of the supply chain and to defend it on the borders. So it was, I mean... Russia. Russia. <laughs> the only thing you need to know in history if if you want to dominate the world, don't attack Russia. <laughs> Fighting a major battle, the army had already suffered 20% casualties from exhaustion and illness, particularly typhus and dysentery. The army had entered Russia with a quarter of a million horses, but they were now dying at a rate of a thousand every day from exhaustion and lack of fodder. What? It wasn't just a thousand cavalry a day. horses that were dying, but the very horses that were supposed to haul the army's transport wagons, making a bad situation worse. This crisis in horsepower came just as the French light cavalry, Napoleon's eyes and ears, met their match in Russia's Cossacks. The Cossacks! My minister told me there is a catastrophe coming this winter. To face this, I need to arrange farmers to plant food as much as possible in the spring. When the weather food, gets hot, something Napoleon needed in this campaign. Uh, some people ask me why I don't, you know, like use ad blocker and so on. Uh, I know that creators earn with all, every ad that is shown on their videos, so I'm here also to support them, so I'm not gonna use ad blocker, and I would also discourage you to use ad blockers, because that's one of the ways how creators uh, earn their money on uh, on YouTube and use it to make those great videos, so I'm not gonna use ad blocker. Yeah, the Cossacks. Cossacks. Self-reliant, proud, ruthless, and superb horsemen didn't play by the same rules as other European cavalry. Every day they shadowed Napoleon's army, swooping in whenever they saw an easy target, but melting away into the forests if they were attacked by a stronger force. Cossacks were also used to uh, expand Russia to the east. Look it up. Uh, when Russia started to expand to the east, uh, uh, they used Cossacks because they were so, so efficient. And as, uh, as far as I know, and if you're from Russia, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but Cossacks are a big part of, you know, like 
uh, Russian tradition and culture and so on. But they were pretty capable uh, cavalry men because uh, and they would also be very uh, how to say it's like self reliant. They could, you know, like they knew exactly in which forest, uh, uh, which mushroom to eat and which plant to eat and which not. So you could just send them somewhere as, I don't know, partisan or shock troops, whatever, or partisan troops, and they could survive on their own for weeks and weeks. So it was, they, they were pretty, pretty effective throughout history. Cossacks, as well as Russian partisans, made hit and run attacks on French supply lines and depots forcing Napoleon to divert thousands of troops to their defence. Alongside Russian regular light cavalry, they also prevented French patrols from carrying out reconnaissance, which meant that Napoleon often lacked good information about roads or the enemy's whereabouts. Napoleon stayed 16 days at Vitebsk, resting his troops and considering his options. Among his many mounting concerns was the security of his long, exposed flanks. But at Vitebsk, he received news that Schwarzenberg had defeated the Russians at Gorodezhna. A week later at Polatsk, a French Bavarian force fought Wittgenstein's Russian First Corps to a standstill. Napoleon's flanks were secure for now. Yeah, but look, he's like half, half the way to Moscow. Uh, it's crazy. Although his main force had been reduced to less than half its original strength, Napoleon decided to push on to Smolensk and try to force the Russians into a decisive battle for the city. Barclay was indeed under pressure to give battle from fellow commander Prince Bagration and Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg. The army's morale and Russia's honor required it, they told him. With the first and second Russian armies finally linking up near Smolensk, Barclay decided to attack Napoleon's army, which he believed was concentrated around Rudnya. The offensive was led by General Platov's Cossacks, who surprised a French cavalry division at Inkova. But alarmed by false reports that Eugène's IV Corps was outflanking him to the north, Barclay called off the attack. Napoleon, reassured that Barclay's offensive posed no real threat, began a grand outflanking move to the south to take Smolensk and cut off the Russian retreat. The so-called Smolensk maneuver was Napoleon at his best, using Murat's cavalry to screen his movements and keep Barclay in the dark. The Emperor reached the Dnieper on the evening of the 13th of August. His engineers quickly threw up four pontoon bridges, and by dawn the next day, his army was across. Marshal Davout led a second column across the river at Orsha. But a single Russian division, the 27th, fought a heroic fighting retreat from Krasny, delaying the French advance and buying time for Bagration to reinforce the Smolensk garrison. The chance for a surprise assault on the city was lost. And as the Russian army began to pull back, Napoleon displayed an uncharacteristic lack of urgency, even halting the army for a parade to mark his 43rd birthday. When the main attack on Smolensk Why? began two days later, Napoleon opted for a frontal assault. 150 French guns battered the city, as three French corps attacked its medieval fortifications. The Russians resisted bravely, but Barclay, fearing encirclement, ordered another retreat. With Smolensk in flames, the Russians began to pull out. Just as the French fought their way into the city, to scenes of utter devastation. Bagration's second army withdrew first, as Barclay's army followed, its rear guard was caught by Ney's 3rd Corps at Valutino. General Junot, commanding the Westphalian 8th Corps, had orders to cut off Barclay's retreat. But having crossed the river, he did nothing, and the opportunity was lost. 
A furious Napoleon swore that Junot would never now win his marshal's battle. <laughs> the Battle of Smolensk cost both sides <clears throat> around 10,000 casualties and destroyed one of Russia's most historic and holy cities, but settled nothing. Yeah. No. No. After the mist. So, at Smolensk, as, as I as I told you many times before, at that time, taking on big fortified cities is very important for the supply chain, and I'm not gonna repeat it again. But at Smolensk, he had what, like two, maybe more tactical options that I can, you know, like think of. One is to go to Moscow. And one is to go directly to St. Petersburg, which was the capital of Russia back then. But Moscow was the capital before that, and it's also a big historical city and, and so on. But, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, if, if I was eager as him, I would probably... And if I would also think that attacking Russia is the only way, I would also continue to Moscow. I don't know why exactly, but it looks like a logical way to do it. I don't know why. Because maybe then you could cut like Russian forces or the Russian territory in half, then attacking uh, St. Petersburg directly. And then I'm thinking also like, why didn't he went through the Baltic area, you know, like the Baltic coast to St. Petersburg? Because then... He wouldn't be that close to the Cossacks and he wouldn't need to defend, you know, like two parts of the of the supply chain or two sides of the supply chain, because one would be on the on the Baltic uh, uh, coastline and he would only need to defend, you know, like one side of the supply chain. Let me know what you think about it. I don't know. Chance to defeat the Russians at Smolensk. Napoleon paused once more to consider his options. Like, yeah, like, why didn't he attack, like, in this direction? Because I would say that the Russians would put everything in front of St. Petersburg to defend it. Uh, but maybe he was thinking, like, okay, if I attack this way through Riga and then St. Petersburg... The Russians could do a counterattack on the Duchy of Warsaw. And, yeah, that leaves actually too, too much space open here to cut the supply chain. Forget it. <laughs> His men were weary and far from home, and it was already late in the campaigning season. He considered sitting out the Russian winter at Smolensk and resuming the campaign in 1813. But now he was just 230 miles from Moscow. A century earlier, Peter the Great had moved Russia's capital to St. Petersburg. But Moscow remained its historic and spiritual heart. Yep. A prize for which the Russians had to fight. Napoleon, always a gambler, decided to push on. The Russians faced their own dilemma. Emperor Alexander. And also, if you think about it, during the Napoleonic Wars and the First World War and the Second World War, Moscow is always like in the center of the European part of Russia. And it connects, you know, like the north and the south parts, the east and the west parts. Uh, and if you look at the railway system in Russia, you can see everything goes to and from Moscow. Like it's a big. Just like a, I would say, you know, like a heart or the brain of Russia, where everything starts. And everything is connected through Moscow. Dilemma. Emperor Alexander had experienced a kind of religious epiphany that summer, and rallied the Russian people to the country's defense, describing the war with Napoleon as a war to save Holy Mother Russia from the Antichrist. Yeah, Napoleon For was months, already described as Antichrist by the Spanish and so on. stand and fight or retreat. Now he decided change was needed. The cautious General Barclay kept his job, but the Emperor summoned General Mikhail Kutuzov to take overall Here command he is again. of Russia's armies. 
Kutuzov had been beaten by Napoleon at Austerlitz seven yep. years before, but he'd since won several victories against the Ottoman Empire and was a true Russian, loved by the troops. Although Kutuzov agreed with Barclay's strategy of delay, he saw that constant retreats were destroying the soldiers' and the nation's morale. If Moscow was given up without a battle, the fallout could be disastrous. And so, 70 miles west of the city, near the village of Borodino, the Russian army prepared to make a stand. Europe was about to witness the bloodiest day's fighting of the Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> Napoleon's bloodiest day, Borodino, 1812. This series possible. This yeah, a big shout out every time, a big shout out to the patrons of, of Epic History TV because they support the creators directly and, uh, or this creator directly which makes it easier for him to make this great videos. I really hope that Epic History TV is going to be around, around for a long, long time on YouTube. Okay, I hope that you enjoyed it. We're continuing with Napoleonic's invasion of uh, Russia and eventually his retreat from Russia. Um, in future videos, I'm going to continue to do them and cover them. As always, if you want to be part of the community, just hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. If you want to uh, add or correct me on something, please do it in the comment section below. And until next time, see ya.